Welcome back to the History of Rock podcast. His name is Brant and he's the DJ. His name is Shim. He's the rock star. Class is in session. And today we are kicking off things with some mud honey. We have yeah. covered kind of the seminal grunge bands in regards to the ones that had the major commercial success, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. But Mud Honey, even though we were calling Green River in the last episodes, Green River as the uh, first true grunge band, Mud Honey's really, I mean, Mud Honey's really the first true grunge band, if not the only grunge band. And that's, in fact, what I'm going to be well, titling. Why do you say that? When you say the true grunge band versus the only where does that come from? Uh, I mean, only. Because I, th- I think that well, well, you'll see it here when we get to the stuff in the episode is that grunge wasn't, and we, this is more as we're learning as we go along here, that grunge wasn't necessarily a specific sound. It wasn't even necessarily a specific look because the packaged flannel look was something that I think record labels ended up doing after the fact, to be like, oh, hey, we want to kind of put you into this mold. And you would yeah. know about stuff like that. Like, you know, labels do yeah. stuff like that. I used to, I, I always wonder what it would have been like if you were a grunge band when they were popping. Because I remember the main thing with the puppies, it was, well, like, where's the jacket? Where's the wallet chain? Like, there were things that you had to the have. The late 90s, early 2000s, mid 2000s, yeah. sort God of. Forbid, God forbid a stylist for a record label came in and said, I'm sorry, someone has to be, ha- someone needs a bandana hanging out of something. Oh my God. <laughs> or if it's like, during Aerosmith's big, uh, big heyday, yeah. it's like, hey, we need you to throw like 10 bandanas yeah. on your mic. I just thing. think it would have been funny if you were a grunge band and you just wore jeans and t shirts and you were like, man, this is our music. And someone came into the rehearsal room and said, yo, Someone get this man a flannel. I'm pretty sure that happened. I would be that willing to bet that, sure. that happened a lot. Yeah, so, that would have happened for sure. So we're covering Mud Honey the same way that we did with Green River, where we're not covering one particular album. We're covering the existence of Mud Honey, which they, they're still around. They still do stuff, except awesome. there's a great documentary on them. It's available on YouTube. It's called I'm Now. And it talks about how even today... and it, it, documentary i think was from 2012 so about 10 years old but even then the guys like mark arm and steve turner who are in the band they have other things they need to to take care of and so they still are technically mud honey it's just when mud honey can fit around the other pieces of their lives right so before we really get into it here a couple of things to note uh i'm going to be changing how we do the playlist on spotify i thought the idea of hey we're gonna have just three songs it's it's not working out. We don't. We don't. It doesn't we, work out as much. Here's the problem: it doesn't work out as much unless both of us love the album. And well, the last two albums, I've said I don't like these records. But not and even, that's the whole point of the podcast. But not even that. It's like there was times where we forgot about it. And the point of the the playlist is so that people can listen to the music that we're talking about. And I did it sort of as a content for the podcast where we could discuss and debate the songs. And I, it's just not working out. So yeah, I'm opening it up we talk more. Too much shit. And quite we frankly, just, just the main ran. reason behind it, too, is I'm going to add all of Alice in Chains' dirt to the playlist. Right. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But but we, we're going to open it up a little bit more, especially when it comes to like Green River, Mud Honey. Limiting them to three songs, is, I think, is a, is a bit much. So we're going to go back and we'll change it up. So if there is a, spati- a particular song from one of the albums we've covered or one of the bands we've covered that did not get added... Uh, anybody out there listening, you're more than free to hit us up on our social medias. You can find Shim at Shim Music uh, or at Shim on Facebook. You can find me at The Real Brandalorian and drop us a message and I'll throw it on the playlist. I got no problems with that. Yeah. Second item yeah. of note is uh, merchandise is here. It's been ordered. I've already had messages from people telling me I've already started to order the merchandise. So I'm hoping yeah. that by the time this episode drops, there's still merchandise to be had. I mean, yeah. it's a good sign if it's already gobbled up and we need to order more. But if you head to VivaLamoca.com, you can purchase the merchandise there. Go to the top, and you're going to see the Real Brandalorian. There are three different T-shirts, three different stickers, where it's the Real Brandalorian. You've got the History of Rock podcast, and then, of course, you have the Cross-Eyed Bear. Cross-Eyed Bear is so great. I thought about sending Charlie from Viva La Mocha, who's the phenomenal artist that's done all the designs. I thought about sending him the idea of doing a shave and a haircut. Got to do it. But how would we incorporate that? Is that we'll figure it out. It's something I'm, I'm thinking of. So if you can, 
go there, vivalamoca.com, and you can order your stuff. The real Brandalorian link is going to be right at the top of the page, but we got to get into Mud Honey here as we're almost five minutes already into this episode. So um, I'm titling this episode, it's, it's Mud Honey, the only true grunge band. And we're going to get to why here in a little bit. And like I said, we're going to be covering sort of their entire existence, which spans from 1988 until now. They're still around. They're a band. And it consists of Mark Arm, who is on rhythm, uh, rhythm guitar and vocals, Steve Turner, who's on lead guitar, Dan Peters on drums and percussion. And then originally, it was a gentleman by the name of Matt Lucan, who was on the bass. He was there from 88 to 2000. And then a guy by the name of Guy Madison took over on bass from 2001 until present. So we're going to roll right into the information here on Mud Honey. And it's a little known factoid right out of the gate that Mark Arm's real name, not Mark Arm. It is either Mark McLaughlin or McLaughlin. Because I've seen it pronounced both ways when it's spelt that way. And their original uh, th- their original band, which we talked about in the Green River episode, was Mr. Epp and the Calculations. That was named after one of Arm's math teachers. That so Mr. Epp, Epp was actually... Mr. Epp was the name of the math teacher. He was a math teacher. It's fantastic. So no one... This is why I love the when people... And that poor guy... Darius, and the only reason I remember Darius Rucker's name is because he's constantly, you have to remind that it's not Hootie. And that's like, so how many people would have actually said that the singer of Mr. Epp and the Calculations was he's Mr. Mr. Epp? Yeah, probably. Yeah, of course. But they There's were no kids. They were, I mean, they were kids when they started this band. And did you, interesting side note about Hootie and the Blowfish with oh, Darius yeah. Rucker is that when they first hit it big, I had read that he would get upset when people would call oh, yeah. him Hootie. Oh yeah, people still do. But then, people, but then by about the mid two thousands, when it, that success had tapered off, and before he reinvented and completely blew up um, mm. as a as a country singer, <clears throat> um, he got to the point where he was like, "It's when they stop calling you Hootie because they forget who you are. That's yeah. what sucks." <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So going back to mine, uh, back to Mud Honey, the first performance of the band. Oh, sorry, not Mud. We're, we're talking about now. We're talking about Mud Honey, but we're talking about. And this is in reference to Mr. Epp and the calculations. Yeah. The first performance of that band was actually a joke. Shocking, as it wasn't even really a band at the beginning. This I love. It was at school, 1978, singing Marvin Gaye's gotta give it up they use rolled up maps as guitars because they couldn't actually play instruments so does that mean that the first show was basically pantomime yeah (laughs) this would have been very similar i'm assuming as any of the bands that i'd created for the game the video game rock band you know moist Mm -hmm. funk king dick and the shades of glory they weren't actual bands because we couldn't play (laughs) we couldn't play instruments it was it was for a video game and this was what they started as and eventually, they, they kind of uh, morphed into a real band. They played their first show. Three years later, they were on a compilation, I'm assuming cassette tape at the time, that was called First Strike. Now, we talked about this when we were talking about Green River in the previous episode of Mr. Epp and the Calculations being, quote, the worst band in the world. So they appeared on a, a radio station called KZAM, and they were introduced as the worst band in the world. Now, when we talked about it in the previous episode, we had noticed that Mark Arm, the lead singer, was the guy who was quoted as you know saying they were the worst band in the world. But then it also gave it to this DJ on KZAM. So what I'm assuming is he was the one that told the DJ, hey, introduce us as the worst band in the world. And so that's why they both get credit for it. I can imagine you go, this is not the worst band in the world. No, this is the calculations. This is not, I just can imagine. <laughs> just play it as out of tune as you can for the whole thing to live up to the worst band. I wish someone, I wish I'd been called the worst singer, worst band in the world at one time, and then just lived up to the notoriety and just, you'd, you'd be able to suck for the whole set. Yeah. There's not a whole lot that you'd have to live up to. And then and we I can can't have wait. everyone from my old high school, from Mossman High School, everyone can type in and go, we were there, Shim, you were that bad. Uh, Mossman, Mossman High School, what was your... Get uh, off the stage! What was your mascot of your high school? <laughs> oh, we didn't have fucking, this is Australia, we don't have mascots you guys don't have, high wait, schools. Really? So it's no, just the name of the have, high school? Yeah. So do you have, you know what we have? Do you have sports You teams? know what schools in Australia have? Schools in Australia have a school crest, do you know what that is? 
I would assume, yeah, I know what a crest is, so I'd assume it's like a, yeah. a typical crest. Yeah, so every school has a crest and a motto. We don't have a... Uh, a mascot. A, a mascot, yeah. And the funny thing is no one gives a shit about the crest or the motto. What's, no one what was your it. motto at Mossman? Excellence leads to success. <laughs> as we're this talking is my about, point. As we're talking about being the worst band in the world and, and just being yeah. able to just go take a big dump on stage. Only excellence leads to success or something like that. It literally was like, oh, we started a high school. We're about to open it tomorrow. Oh, we don't have a thing for the crest. Blah! That's it's either, no, it's either, it's either that or somebody had just gone to, like, gotten Chinese uh, Chinese food, and that's what was in yeah. their fortune cookie. And fortune it was like, excellent cookie, leads exactly. To, hey, guys, I figured it out. We're right here. Yeah. yeah. No, we don't have any of... That's just... Uh, we, we called it so Adidas, you, not Adidas, uh, Nike, not Nike, and weird. we don't have mascots. So what do you... We don't, so, we, don't, we don't celebrate ourselves the way that you guys celebrate yourselves. Well, yeah, because we have low self-esteem. So do we... Do we when you're on a, like a high school team, it's just called the high school. It's not because here it's just Mossman High. Because yeah, like here, if you, you know, were, especially even in the pros, no. like you would have the New England Patriots. It's not just New England. It's kind of funny. We didn't have it when it came to at least we didn't when no, we didn't have it. You would be the name of your school was the name of the team. It was like if it was Mossman High soccer team, and you Mossman. were going against it was just Mossman, Moss, the Mossman High team. There was no mascot. There was no name of the team. We didn't. You could be Moss Man, like in He Man. And just as or we could go moss. to the next thing, which was that to promote Mr. Epp, Arm wrote a letter. To, he wrote a letter to the. Ed, I love the face that you just pulled. Like, oh, because oh, I because like I can't wait because this is one that when I first saw this in the documentary, oh, I got yeah. super excited because this ties everything in here. Okay, to promote Mr. Epp. Arm wrote a letter to the editor from the point of view of someone who had seen the band and hated them. He remembered writing that they were quote unquote pure shit and pure grunge, but adds that but adds that this isn't the first time the word grunge was used to describe music. He talks about Australian band The Scientists and the Beasts of Bourbon described being described as grunge in the early 80s. My question to you is, is that true or did he make it up? I don't know. I, I tried to do some research, but I ran out of time this weekend, so I'm going to do even more because he presents it as, yeah, because this next fact here is so a gentleman, uh, Tex Perkins, who was do the I vocalist. Know you yeah. know Tex Perkins? I've met him. I don't know him personally. I know of him in a big way, but most people in America would have never heard of Tex Perkins. He's like Australian punk rock grunge royalty. Yeah, and like royalty. Yeah. So he's the vocalist of the Beasts of Bourbon, and he was once called the High Priest of Grunge. Yeah. The guy that said that apparently said it to him, and then got punched in the face by because Ted that's Perkins. that's exactly what the High Priest of Grunge would do. To expect anything less is just insulting. So that's why I think there is some truth to that story yeah. of these early '80s Australian punk bands being described as grunge, because we yeah. then have this backup story of. Tex Perkins being called the high priest of grunge. Yeah, because here's the thing. Most people don't realize that half of all rock music actually came out of Australia. Like all genres, like people think about like heavy rock or whatever. ACDC was doing ACDC in the 70s, right? Like they were doing it in Australia around the time that black, but they, they went to the UK and started to blow up and do so, do big things, but they were around for 10 years before people really heard of them. So they were doing all of that, that sound. And Tex Perkins and the Beast of Bourbon is the sound of grunge, but you don't call it grunge. You just call it like Oz, like it's kind of, it's what we, you know what the truth is? I just put this together. We called it pub rock. Okay. Because ACDC was kind of like pub rock, but then they evolved and they went on to, and then it just became ACDC. And in the 80s, in the mid 80s, that was kind of like pub, it was grimy, grungy, sweaty, throwing beer around, smack, it, it was just messy, grungy rock. It was like punk, but it wasn't as focused as punk because punk was very anti-establishment. It was like, we're making a choice to not be part of the establishment. In Australia, be suburban and that sort of like grungy pub rock was more like a bit of working class, a bit of the everyman. You can be a little bit punk and whatever, but we're not really, we don't give a shit about what your thing is. We just want to drink beer and get fucking stoned and fucking break shit and go fucking crazy. 
And like that was Tex Perkins, the the quintessential Aussie pub fucking don't fucking say anything about anything. Just have a fucking drink and shut up. And I think before anybody starts Googling bee suburban, it's beasts of bourbon. I figured I had to slow that down because uh, when I heard it in the documentary, even then I was kind of like, what did they say? But it's the beasts of bourbon. So yeah. here's my question for you, and I'm wondering if you could do you can you do the intro to Thunderstruck right now? Would you be able to do that? And then sing a song about Tex Perkins punching a guy in the face. And I'm gonna sing at the same time. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Call me nothing, you fucking prick! Fuck ya! Punch you in the face with my fucking dick! Fuck ya! Sorry, that's about as. Hey, you hit the intro. You you hit the intro, and that's that's really all I wanted right there. Dude, if we could somehow do like a do like a remix of that, um, for an intro to uh, the history of rock podcast, that would be amazing. But anyway, we we should actually see. You could reverse it and do it. So anyway, going back to my one, we're gonna have sorry, we're gonna have to mute that for the uh, social media posts if we decide to. I'll punch you in the face with my dick. Um, <laughs> um, there was a short-lived joke punk band, The Arm, and that oh, so, that, that arm, sorry, sorry, that's a typo. There was a short-lived joke punk band that Arm and Turner were in before starting Green River, and it was called the Limp Richards. There's no chance that Limp Biscuit took a thing off that, right? No, I don't think so. Good. I, okay, cool. I, not, not, that Limp- I, not as I know. And it's, I, I threw this fact in there because it just, it's the past it's few fantastic. episodes, it's been all about just these random ass band names from Mr. Epic and the Calculations the thing. This for is, the Limp Richards. This is going back to the thing that we said before about, and one of the things that um, Dave Grohl has gone on record as saying, usually bands all bands have these periods when they make stupid mistakes and they do stupid shit and they break up and they have lineup changes and Dave Grohl went on the record as saying that that was one of the things that he really was he regrets that the Foo Fighters never got a chance to do that because they had to do it all in the public eye they did it they had lineup changes and they had mistakes that they made but it was all done at the top level from the beginning because of because he was coming out of Nirvana but that's this is half of what history of it's called the history of rock. This is what it's about: learning about all this stupid. And they there's no times when grunge bands, especially, are making these amazingly well educated, planned decisions. No, it's all fucking messy. No, so uh, as we had talked about in the previous episode, so Green River essentially takes up the years of 1984 to 1988 for Mark Arm, with Mud Honey starting right after the breakup of Green River. Now, Mud Honey they named themselves after the Russ Meyer film. Mud Honey. Now, in the documentary that I watched, the band acknowledges they don't remember a whole lot of the movie. They just remember that there's like a preacher and some boobs. And that was it. Because Russ Meyer, B-movie, you know, director, very cheesy, very corny. The acting certainly not top-notch because they weren't able to afford decent actors. But they took the name from, I think it was because Mark Arm had mentioned that he'd seen the movie and he remembered the name specifically. Ooh, if... I get another band, Mud Honey would be a cool band name. And it's, it just right. ended up being that that was the one that stuck. That's the band that's lasted now for, you know, almost 40 years. Mm. Yeah, and Mud Honey did Mud Honey did make it over to Australia in the in terms of passing cassettes around and talking about it. They were never on the radio, but when you were getting into grunge, like Mud Honey was if you didn't know Mud Honey, you, you cool. would get the shit kick, you weren't cool, you get the shit kicked out of you. You get it. You get a Steve Perkins punch to the face. There you go. Actually, we should just talk that from now on. That's going to be the internal reference. We're just going to say you, he copped a Steve Perkins, not a Will no, Smith, because he has a Perkins. closed fist. Tex Perkins. Sorry, you what did text. I say? You get it. You said Steve Perkins because you're looking Steve at Steve Perkins. Turner on the on the sheet. Steve Turner. That's correct. Thank you very much, Steve Turner. Steve Turner was called the Eric Clapton of grunge in Rolling Stone magazine, while Jake and Dino, Jack producer, Andino. what? Jack. Jake, what did I? I'm I'm sorry, but I'm trying to. Here's the problem. Just for just full disclosure, I don't read these ahead of time so that we can discuss them candidly. So I'm trying to think of things to say while I'm. Anyway, Jack Tur- Jack and Jack Turner, Steve Turner, and fucking Brandon Coates, producer of all the major grunge acts. He said that he remembers only having one comment when he first recorded with Mudhoney, and it was, "Are you sure you want the guitars to be this dirty?" 
Thank God that you added that in. That is a classic quote for a fucking mud honey sounding band. Yeah, that, I, that's the only quote that he said that he really had for the band when he was recording with them. And again, Jack and Dino's name pops up a lot here at the beginning of these episodes of the history of rock because he was kind of the grunge producer. And when he was recording with Mud Honey, he had only been a recording a record producer for uh, maybe a little over a year, I think. So it's still very early on. He still has all the like the re- the eight track tapes and everything else that mm. that was um, put together for it. And that's a guy that again that we need to reach out to. I would love, 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 love to sit that down and have be a chat with him. An extended history of rock podcast. For oh sure. yeah, we need a day with him. Yeah, we we <laughs> would uh, we would do that one for a while. So mm. you know, if you've ever ordered anything from Mud Honey, such as through the band's website, maybe you're ordering a special edition album or something like that. Uh, chances are it actually came from Mark Arm himself because he's the one that takes care of the shipping and packaging because it's what he likes to do. He says it keeps him busy. It's kind of, it's, he doesn't want somebody else doing it. He wants to make sure that it's done right. So when you'll see on the shipping label, it'll say, you know, be signed off by Mark. That is Mark Arm that's taking care of the shipping and packaging. (laughs) That is so great. That's so grunge. Yeah. That's so fucking grunge. I love it. (laughs) Um, next, a great quote, apparently, from Kim... Ta- is it Tahil? Thile. Thile. I keep messing it up. It's been how many podcasts has he come up in now, and I still can't get it right. Kim Tile, And who Mud Honey is, they are... Or he, he spoke on who he believed Mud Honey is. They are the people who would be watching them. That's what makes them an incredibly honest band. What does that mean, exactly? So, they weren't posing as anything other than just who they were. So they would have been the person that's in their audience at their show, which makes them right, even more honest because they are their audience. You know, and you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll get bands out there that they do something that um, or there's some sort of a persona on stage or they may be different. He's like, no, that's them. And I got to tell you, as I watched this documentary and I was researching Mud Honey, um, I gained more and more respect for Mud Honey. Uh, than I ever even thought possible. Like they've they've vaulted up to one of my favorite acts as just how they are as people and how they were as a band. Because again, they were just that's who they were, and they didn't give a fuck, and they had no yeah. problems being themselves. Um, they even like speaking of which, they had a song on the With Honor soundtrack. There's a movie called With Honors. It's called Run Shithead Run, and that's because the scene is literally of a guy running across a campus. And it's on the soundtrack. Right. You can go get the soundtrack for With Honors, and the song is just called Run, Shit, Head, Run. That's fantastic. The guys in Mud Honey are known for doing a sound check and continuing to stick around together rather than splitting their separate ways like most bands. So hmm. question for you there is, yeah, yeah, how yeah. would it be for you and the puppies? You can even compare it to early on to later on. When you would guys, when you guys would do a sound check, is it cool? Sound checks done. We all go separate our separate ways. We'll be back here on stage together, or was it? Let's hang out for a little bit. Uh well, you at the beginning, sound check was an opportunity to rehearse. Mm-hmm. So like you'd be touring and you'd be in the van or the bus or whatever, and you wouldn't be able. You, that was your only time to really work out new ideas. So when we were still working out new ideas together, we would work out new ideas. But then after we weren't doing that, and as soon as relationships get tense, you don't stick around after soundcheck. You don't even really talk to each other at soundcheck because soundcheck, people don't realize, soundcheck is literally the most boring thing that you can possibly do if you're a guy in a band because you have to go there, you have to play the same songs, but you have to do it without having fun and stand there in the position that you're supposed to stand in and just play the same part over and over again. And you and the reason that you play the exact same part over and over again is because the sound guy is used to how you play that part. So he knows, okay, that part's supposed to sound like this. Let me tweak all these knobs and buttons and things so that it sounds right coming out of the speakers. So you've got to stand there and literally just play the same fucking chorus for five minutes until he goes, okay, now do it on the bass. Okay, now do it on the drums. Okay, now sing some things. So you get up there and you just, you're literally just blah, 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 blah. And then they, and then they tell you to get off the stage. So as soon as you can, that's why bands don't show up for sound check. Cause they're like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long does a sound check generally take? A sound check can, it depends on the sound guy, can take half an hour, but usually if everything's set up, bands shouldn't need to do more than play a couple songs. Go out and play a couple songs. 
And then the sound, the sound oh, guy, good. if he's been with you for a while, yeah, if, if it's a new sound guy, it'll take a million years. If it's a guy that's been with you for ages, he'll go, yeah, I know how the shit sounds, I know how it's supposed to be tweaked, and he'll do it. Yeah, so it shouldn't take that long. But if you're, if you're getting along as a band, it's just, it just goes to show that like Mudhoney clearly enjoyed each other's company. If you're getting along as a band, you'll just jam. You'll just be on stage and you'll go, do we have 20 minutes? Yeah, cool, let's have a jam. If you don't like each other, you fucking leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like, it, it, we're going to get to this in either this episode or the next one. We're talking about Mudhoney here. And it, it, there are parts where the band kind of, like there's a, there is a split in the band at, at some point, but it wasn't, oh my God, they're tired of each other. Um, they just need to get some distance. They need to go do, you know, it's, it was just kind of, it almost felt like a natural pause, like a sabbatical. And then they just kind of came back together. But going yeah. back to the origins of the band, January 1st, 1988, that's considered the band's birthday. And their first album was called Super Fuzz Big Muff, which, Great. a question for you. Yeah. Do you know where that came from? Super Fuzz knew- Big Muff. I knew immediately as soon as I read it, I thought, what a great name for an album. Because that's the those are the first two pedals that every guitar player gets. Yep. You plug your guitar pedal into a super, especially because that is this grunge is the sound of the super fuzz and the big muff pedal. There, by the way, for anyone that doesn't know, they're classic common pedals. But if you didn't know what they were, it'd just be a cool sounding band. Oh, album absolutely. Pod. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> super fuzz big muff is just a fantastic name. But Jim's right; it, it comes from the first two pedals that they had because yeah. It everyone would, uh, gets, dude, everyone, everyone listens to every grunge rock record and goes, I want to play guitar. They buy a Les Paul or a Strat, depending on the guitar player they like, and the next thing you buy is a fucking Big Muff. That's what you do. If you mm-hmm. don't do that, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. This next one here, this is kind of a pop culture reference. Is that me? Yeah. Oh, you went all the way through. Mud Honey was in. Oh, okay, cool. Mud Honey was in the famous scene from the black from Black Sheep with Chris Farley, where they're at a Rock the Vote show. Mud Honey's performing, and when they're done, they're the ones that confuse Farley's character for his brother, who is running for the governor, and they push him out on stage. Then comes the amazing Kill Whitey clip. So, there's going to be more on this. Later in the podcast, yeah. Since we're I not... actually don't, I don't know that reference as well as you probably do. Well, and I saw the movie I... when I was a kid. Oh, see, I was going to ask if you'd even seen the movie because Black Sheep, yeah. it nearly, it didn't do nearly as well as Tommy Boy. There's a lot of people who thought they were just kind of rehashing some stuff, and it really, it just, it, it wasn't as good of a movie. I found it hilarious. I think I love Black Sheep. Of course, I think Tommy Boy is better, but. There's this one scene where it's at a Rock the Vote show, and Mud Honey, they're the ones that are up on stage. They can he they ask Chris Farley what his name is, and this is after he has spent the time backstage hanging out with the Rasta band, and he's gotten high off of their yeah. secondhand smoke, and he became best yeah. friends. And he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I'm Whitey, or I'm the man, and I'm oppressing you. And they're all like, yeah, and he goes... Oh, that's bull crap! I'm gonna t- I'm gonna talk to some people about this, and then he goes out there and he's getting all the the crowd's getting all ramped up, and he's starting to feed off of the crowd, and then he looks over to the side and he sees that band over there, and he goes, "Kill Whitey!" <laughs> and then it's just crickets. <laughs> Love that movie. I got, it's a, it's now a, I gotta watch it. Yeah, it's a good movie, but we're getting so. At the end of these, at the end of part twos, at least, is when we get to the Today on the State. And since we're talking about the entirety of Mud Honey, not one particular album, I chose that. So we're going to be discussing more on Black Sheep coming up here at the end of part two. But their manager, right. Bob Whitaker, and I'm telling you, if you guys get a chance, go to YouTube and watch the documentary. Bob Whitaker, he was a different kind of manager. So they admitted that they kept him around for entertainment because he was. Yeah. He was just a wild, crazy ass Let me just cut in for a sec. If you're wondering where Brandon's going this, when he says he was a different kind of manager, just remember that Mark Arm still posts the merch directly. Yeah. (laughs) Doesn't Well, I mean, yeah, he's not... Bob Whitaker, I don't think he's... I mean, he's considered their friend, but he's not actually a manager anymore, I don't think. But when they would ask him to help move some equipment or get somebody on the guest list, you know, things that a manager would take care of for a band... He would usually tell them, no, go do it your fucking self. And then they would. <laughs> but they wouldn't say anything because they were all such good friends. He was kind of considered mm. the fifth member of the band because right. they truly just seemed like a group of guys that were really good friends that just happened to be in a band. 
and that right. was it. And everything kind of just went their way the way that they that they wanted to. But they did say the one thing that he was really good at was always finding a place to stay. So, you know, being in a band early on, you're in a van and you're driving around trying to find places to stay. And they without had Google Maps. Yeah, without Google Maps or the Internet at all. And yeah. they would talk about how, well, generally when you were in this, a band like ours, it was, you know, this early grunge or like a punk band. You go play or you go stay at the a punk house where it's this van or it's somebody else and it's this dirty ass house and it's gross and and you know those are the places that you stay. But what Bob so Whitaker t- remind me to tell you about my first one of those after this point. Oh, absolutely. So what Bob Whitaker would do is he had this connection where he was able to find the college chicks that were in a sorority house or you know at an upper scale college, and he was able to talk his way into letting the band. Stay with them, and they said that that's that not was a talent. one of his biggest. That's biggest not a talent. Points. That's literally go and find the sorority girls and say, "Would you like the band to stay at your house?" That's not hard. Well, <laughs> but you, you have a, if if it's it's different if you say, "I've got four random guys that need a place to crash." But if you're like, "Hey, we're in a rock band and we're touring," college girls are like, "Yeah, come stay at our place." Yeah, come but on. It, like, yeah, sorry, well, sorry. But the way that they were presenting it is, is these weren't necessarily the girls that are at the show. So it's not like these are people who even know who the hell they are. They don't even know this band. They know it's just, it is, to them, it's just five random ass dudes. They happen to have equipment, but, you know, it's it's not that. Okay, so tell me. So for anyone who doesn't know, when you're starting out in a band, especially in a van and stuff, um, I don't know what you call them. They're, They're not called, they're not groupies. They're basically hardcore fans that are like, we love your music. And we just want to help out. And if you need a place to crash, come and crash at our place. So we met this woman who was married to a dude. Uh, and it was they were very nice. They were very, very, very nice. It was deep southern hospitality. And they said, come to our house. We know what this is like. Every band who we love, we invite them over to their house. And we do pork and beans. And we do your laundry. And we've got a couple of bedrooms because our kids have moved out of the house. Wait a minute. Come and stay. Deep southern, like here in the States? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't, yeah, not in Australia. It's in the States, yeah. Okay. So, and, but it was that, it was the first time that I'd ever seen Southern hospitality until we got to their house and we showed up in the morning and we were like, cool, laundry, food, great. We walk in and every single thing in the house was Elvis Presley. Everything. Every, every doorknob, every seat cover, every poster, every, wardrobe bed sheets uh uh bar cups everything every they had uh, i walked in and i started to freak out and i was like i feel like i'm gonna get murdered in this house i'm gonna exit to the bathroom and regroup i went to the bathroom and there was an elvis toilet seat cover and that's when i knew i was in trouble (laughs) Well, see, I figured that the story was going to be like, it was Southern hospitality, they were very nice, they were very welcoming, and everything was nice up until you're having a conversation, and then all of a sudden the guy drops the N-word, and we're talking the N-word with, like, the hard R, and then you realize, <laughs> oh my God. No, I've like, had these that are too. Like, yeah, it's Southern hospitality yeah. until they find yeah. out you're different uh, other than white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I've, I've had that as well. But the thing, I just thought it was hilarious that the first time that I ever went to deal with, the first time that I ever went to accept hospitality from someone, the funny thing is, they were nice for the whole day. They did everything they said. They gave, they gave us food and all that good stuff. And then we left. But it was just, if, if it hadn't been for Elvis, Elvis, it would have been fine. But Elvis was there everywhere you turned. It, and he, it was always Elvis leaning into the camera, staring at you. So it was like you were fucking being he's constantly, Yeah, he's constantly weird. looking at you. Yeah, yeah, constantly, yeah. So anyway, um, that actually hurt. Mud Honey's debut <laughs> album, Super B- <laughs> Mud Honey's debut album, uh, Super Fuzz Big Muff, first made it big over in England on the indie charts, which was unheard of for an American rock band, and it stayed on the charts for over a year. That is surprising, considering they wouldn't have done any touring there, and it was a really grungy sound. And this is, well, no, they, they did end up going over to Europe. And and because yeah. they they got flown over there because their album was doing so well over there. Yeah. And this was kind of the kickoff. Where I think we mentioned this in one of the first episodes of the history of rock, where we were talking about the beginning of grunge, and that's where the be- like people outside of Seattle first started to hear what grunge was or the sound that I guess we would classify as grunge. 
and it was outside of Seattle. It was over in England, and then all of a sudden it started to gain a little bit more traction, a little bit more traction. They ended up back over here in the States, and Sonic Youth became big fans of Mud Honey, and they brought them on on a West Coast tour, and they were both complete opposites. Where Sonic Youth, they were, obviously they were more mature, they're reading books, and the guys, uh, the guys in Mud Honey, they, they would talk about how they would joke with them all the time, be like, "Hey, what book are you reading today?" Like flipping them shit for <laughs> the fact that they're reading books while they're on tour. And then Mud Honey, they were legitimately just the beer drinking goofballs that would wrestle around, and I mean literally wrestling around. On that documentary, they go through a cycle of pictures and videos of them wrestling. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. The funny thing is that you don't want your rock... This is the thing that people forget. You don't want your rock stars to be anything except rock stars. That's what they showed up to be. If you go, like, if you go and see... Although Sonic Youth really is branded that way, but I remember the only person who I've ever heard of um, was Lemmy. When you find out that Lemmy literally just traveled with a suitcase full of books, he didn't even bring, like, a couple of changes of clothes. He would just like roll around in whatever he was doing. Well, that's but pretty he would always bring out. books. He would always bring a suitcase full of books. That is to be the most godfather of punk, and then go, oh, you could talk about the history of anything. An educated man that is so hardcore. Like he was like a fucking guru. Anyway, so we got to <laughs> do. Right. Motorhead's going to be a fun one. Well, no. So uh, we're gonna before we wrap up here because we'll do. We'll do the, this one last one here because it's talking about England, but I want you to do really quick. Can you do a quick song where we're talking about traveling with books? And I mean, you can make this one about Lemmy if you would like, where he doesn't really care about his looks. All he did was pack his books, something like that. Uh, fucking. Hold on a second. Oh, I'm, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> All my fans are stupid, but I'm better than them Cause I know how to read something and then piss on all your friends Cause I'm a punk rocker <laughs> That was beautiful, loved it, absolutely loved it Alright, let's get to this final one here uh, for you to do And then we'll we'll wrap up this episode Alright, <laughs> sorry, I, I, it's weird to go between those two things Um... At a show in England in which Soundgarden was opening for Mud Honey, could you imagine how dope that fucking Think about show that. would have been? Soundgarden was opening for Mud Honey in a show in England. There was a point at which Mark Arm announced to the crowd, I would like to invite everyone on stage, and they did. It was called the Friendly Riot. Arm called it an out of control good time. However, the stage ended up collapsing. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's why they actually have it in contracts when you go to venues now, where you have to say, I will not incite things. Like, you won't incite violence, but it's also like you agree you will not invite people on the stage. Because if you do, you forego your guarantee because of shit like that. See, the only time I have been at a show where a band invited people on stage, it was Volbeat. And... It was for kids. They were invited. Like, uh. Are there any kids in the audience? And then they were inviting kids up on stage. I think it was during their final song, and That's it was cool. awesome. But I mean, yeah. it, it, it makes sense that that you know you'd have to protect yourself in some way of <laughs> making sure that you're not going to invite everybody in the crowd up on stage and then having the stage completely collapse. Yeah, but that's the thing. People don't really think about this, and it's not it's not really rock and roll, but it's an interesting thing to think about. It's punk rock to say everyone get on stage and do whatever you want. When bands like Green Day, for example, brings a person on stage and says, uh, you know, you're going to play a song and you're, they have to tell the people who are putting on the show beforehand. And Green Day is in charge of getting insurance for stuff like that because it's really taboo and full on. It's not taboo, but it's full on because people, you know, th there are these rules at these shows and it was these sorts of bands and Woodstock and all that sort of stuff where there were no fucking rules and people get fucked up. And yet, that's the stuff that people talk about, and those are the good times. Yeah. So the Volbeat, I wouldn't be surprised if Volbeat were like, we want to try and do things that are fun and awesome, and then they've got to call their lawyer and go, what can we do? Well, we can take some kids up if we cap it to this many, because we're going to make sure there's enough space. And then it looks like it's fun, and it's good, but it's all very planned it's all, out. Yeah, it's all very regimented, it, exactly. Yeah, on what it, it ain't is rock and roll. It ain't rock and roll. But I'm glad they do it. Well, you just burst the bubble, because you know Dave Grohl does that, where he'll let somebody come up on stage, yeah. maybe play guitar, maybe play some drums. Oh, no, no. It's I'm still act like impromptu. I didn't hear 
it's still impromptu. It's still like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick someone. It's just that they've already planned before the show that they're gonna pick someone. They just don't know who it's gonna be and what they're gonna play. Oh, that's fine then. That per- that makes yeah, 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 sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's All not right, like so- they planted someone in the audience. It's not like a magic show. <laughs> I, I honestly, I would be willing to bet that there are some bands that have probably done that. So we're going to wrap up this episode here. Coming up in part two, as we're talking about Mud Honey, we're going to get to kind of uh, the the break of Mud Honey that happens in the, it was right around 1990, where one of the members actually ends up in Nirvana for a little bit. And then there's a song that they wrote. It's not necessarily about Courtney Love, but let's just say Mark Arm said that, yeah, she kind of fits. Uh, that she complained about that got them booted from their label. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned, we're also going to cover Black Sheep. As hey, at, well. least, at least they didn't wind up on a railroad track. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're going to wrap Just up this. Saying. Yeah, we're going to wrap up this episode. Again, quick reminder, if you guys want the merchandise is available, go to VivaLamoca.com. Mm. Check out all their stuff, by the way. Don't just click the real brand DeLorean link at the top and just go there. Check out all the stuff. They do a phenomenal job of incorporating the city of El Paso into their artwork. And you know, Charlie, he's the one that did all the stuff that just looks phenomenal from my logo to uh, uh, the history. But the whole overlay here, the thing that's up above us, thats that was Charlie's work. Uh, actually, the whole thing that's around us, that was Charlie's work. And then, of course, the cross-eyed bear, which is brilliant. And then maybe we'll work on getting a shave and a haircut yeah, T-shirt done as well. We but could, on that, we could, we could we could find a way to plagiarize Roger Rabbit that it's not copyright infringement per yeah, se. Yeah, we'll, we'll tow we tow yeah. that line, baby. That's good. Yeah. We're yeah. We, that's 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 punk rock. It's towing the yeah. line of copyright infringement. That's what it is now. So on that note, we're gonna wrap up. You guys have a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll see you guys next Monday or whenever you're listening to this on the next episode of the History of Rock. Take us out, Shim. His name is Brandon. He's the DJ. His name is Shim. He's the rock star. Class dismissed. Dis- All right. So you know I kept the uh, recording going last time in the last episode. And then right you uploaded you, it? Yeah, oh yeah, it's part of the episode. Because okay. you, what heard, did I like, do? you hear right right when you're signing off, you hear, Wah! like that dude with the chainsaw <laughs> or whatever. And I was like, oh shit, dude, I got to leave you that You want to hear the funniest thing? The funniest thing was I went out after the podcast because I had two other things to do. And I was like, dude... What I like, I don't need to say how much worse it was going to get because it kept getting worse. I'm like, dude, this is they were up next to my house, so I went out, and um, they what they were doing is they parked in my driveway and they were cutting the trees on the next property that were hanging over into my driveway, so they were making a big mess in my driveway, but I hadn't seen it. So I came out and I did the usual, like, I'm the authoritative man that lives in this house and I'm just coming out. So I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not being aggressive, but I'm going to be like, I want to, I want to, I want some answers here. And the guy, this guy walked up and the reason this is funny is because the guy was like 25. Okay. Long hair, you know, dirty, working the trees and whatever. And oh, he, he was grunge. And oh, he's grunge. Uh, maybe, he was grunge. Ooh, he was grunge. he listens to screaming trees. But he, no, well, the funny thing is he was screaming at me. He walked up to me. There was no, no earphones on, nothing. He just, there was no, it all stopped for a second when I came out. He walked up and he said, hey, mate, yeah, we're just using the driveway for a minute, screaming at me. And I'm like, dude, you have been cutting trees with no earphones on since you were 20 <laughs> years old and you're fucking deaf. He was deaf. He was screaming at me in my driveway. And part of me wanted to be like, for the first second, I was like, oh, you're going to yell at me. But then I went, oh, you're deaf. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. No, it's fine. We'll clean it all up. It'll be sweet. We'll clean it all up, mate. Yeah. Oh, plus we got that one over there. It was one hanging on your house. It's gone now. It's gone. (sighs) God, that story could not have gone any better. That was amazing. (laughs) I'm leaving this in, too. So there's that. Yep. (laughs) Fuck it. We'll do the after... We, we should do the um, what, after show or whatever. This is the after clips. show. Dude, people get like I an was extra two say, minutes here. No, I was going to say one thing that we really should do is we need to create either something on a Discord channel or something on a social media platform that we have for the History of Rock for people to share photos of themselves when they get the merch. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so they, like, can, stu- they can. How about this? How about they just tag us on Instagram? That works. But the thing is, I was going to ask, we were talking about doing. We've got an Instagram uh, profile, right? Yeah. We just haven't been doing anything with it yet. Yeah, because I don't have any time. Yeah, I know. I so mean, I had all kinds of plans for it, but... Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> Honestly, dude, I, w I think one of the things that would be really quick and simple, I just thought of it now, is you remember that uh, the calendar that you said you had that sucks? Yeah. Yeah. I when got like the, the one just, good thing that was about Sub Pop Records on there. When a good, is there ever a good one? I, I have some saved. Um, like honestly, which rock, just take which a, rock star performed with Sting at Live Aid in London and then flew across the Atlantic to perform with Led Zeppelin in Philadelphia? Bob Geldof, Phil Collins, Mark Knopfler, or Eric Clapton? Phil Collins. Yeah. I was right? Okay, cool. <laughs> I got it. I mean, I, I can start um, putting listen, this stuff up if you want. Listen, uh, no, all I was going to say is when there's a good one, not a really shit one, but like just a decent one that's enough for people to go, oh, that was worth my time for a, a second. Just take a photo of it and post it. Just take a photo of it and post it with a hashtag of like history of rock and then the name of a couple of things, you know, we'll figure out the hashtags and so that there's something. Mm. And then the next thing we'll do is we'll ask people, because people are going to start getting their merch in a week or two. We'll say, hey, take a photo of yourself with the merch and put it up there and we'll give you a shout out or whatever. Just some good stuff. Works for me. Yeah. Just something to, because I know your time is very limited. I think that'll be a good way right. to... Yeah, do something um, that's 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 engaging but not time consuming. Exactly, it's hard. I know times times a tough one. But that's and that's one of the difficulties of doing shit like this is that trying to find something that works that will people be engaged with can fucking take time. Yes, but, I, but, but we have the accounts. If I think if I remember correctly, I believe I opened a Twitter and a Instagram. I think. Right. But yeah, like I'll, well, I'll start snapping the pictures of that because I I have. I, uh, I got like seven of them right here. We could do like yeah. one every other day or something like that. Yeah. We need to next later in the week when we get a chance to just get on a normal call, we should talk about a few of those things. And then also the last thing I was going to say is, well, TikTok, we should be doing some of the, the trailers, the trailers, the, the promos. I put them on my, my brain. Personal. My brain is gone. I, I, getting up at five is tough. Yeah. Like, by the way, I feel bad because at the start of the podcast, I'm yawning and no one knows it's because I'm like trying to wake myself up. <laughs> well, if I was there, I'd smack so, the shit out of you. I know. I'd give you a Tex Perkins. Te so, yeah, Tex Perkins then, mate. This one's right. That's a good one. We should have a Tex Perkins shirt. Just, oh. a, big, just, a, guy, just a guy holding a big dick like a baseball bat ready to swing it. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want a t-shirt with a guy's dick on it. Yeah, man. History of rock. Grunge all the hit, way. He didn't hit him with his dick. He just punched the guy in the face. You don't know he didn't use his dick. You don't know. You weren't there. <laughs> Fine. Whatever. We'll this, talk this about this Australian. More. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Added yeah, S. That's true. Nike. Christ. All right. Yeah. Later this week, we got to catch up. Let's, uh, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's put a planning session at some point on the books. Yes. At, uh, yeah. And and there's some other stuff to do with like OG life and Insta uh, uh, investor share things that we can tie together. It'll be good. Let's Word make time up, and yeah. actually do that. All right, you got to get your call, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. All right, yeah, love yeah. You, bud. All right, love you, man. Bye. Bye.